All right, guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's dive in with a multiple choice question. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is C, arachidonic acid, which will then, of course, serve as a precursor for the products of the arachidonic acid pathway, like prostaglandins, leukotrienes. Now remember, that linoleic acid, also known as omega-6 fatty acid, is one of the essential fatty acids along with linolenic acid, which is of course also known as omega-3. Now, neither of these can be synthesized by the body. That is why they are essential. We have to eat them. All right, next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is approximately three to four years. Now, this is a very important question, and I've seen it many times over the years. So I want to make sure that you're 100% confident with these couple facts so that on exam day, when you come across a question that asks you about this or that requires that you know it, you're not going to panic. You can actually just say, I know it. Let me answer the question. Move on. So first, remember that fat-soluble vitamins accumulate where? In fat while water-soluble vitamins are easily excreted. But there's two exceptions. There's two exceptions to this rule, vitamin, vitamin B9 and vitamin B12. Now, they're both stored in the liver, but B9 stores, they run out in around three to four months. Three to four. B12 stores don't run out for three to four years. So just keep that in mind. B9 is, is smaller. The number nine is smaller than 12. So three to four months. 12 is larger, larger number, won't run out for three to four years. So what does this mean? Well, it means if you're going to get a vitamin, uh, a B vitamin deficiency, B9 is going to happen much sooner than B12. That's really important to remember. So don't forget that B12 will be missing from the diet of people uh, who are vegans or don't eat any meat or any dairy products. And it's therefore very important that you're supplementing with B12 in that scenario. Now, I haven't seen a lot of questions on that specifically, but because plant-based diets and veganism is such a growing um, dietary choice for people, I wouldn't be surprised if you get something that tests you on this concept. And the best way to test this, because I mean, if they ask you a question, hey, patients are vegan, what do, you, what do you supplement with? That's too easy. But you might say, hey, a patient started eating a plant-based diet, avoids all meat, dairy products, et cetera. Uh, how long before you know they start to experience symptoms or they experience these symptoms of b12 deficiency um you know when was the last time they ate an animal product something along those lines you just need to know these time frames so that you can answer any sort of scenario that might throw at you but regardless whatever it is keep in mind if someone became a vegan uh one month ago they're not experiencing a b12 deficiency okay unless of course there's some other problem but keep these storage times in mind it'll help you a lot on your exam all right, next question is a matching exercise. I want you to match the vitamin with its correct feature or features. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure all of these out, come on back when you think you have the right answers. All right, here are the correct answers. If you need to change anything, please go ahead and hit the pause button and do so. Otherwise, let's talk about vitamins D, E, K, and A. So we're gonna go over some of the highlights. First, remember that as a whole, these are going to be more likely than B vitamins to cause toxicity due to the fact that they get stored in the liver. And their absorption is dependent on both the ileum and the pancreas. And if malabsorption occurs, one thing you will see is steatorrhea, and then eventually what you'll see is fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. Now let's take a look at some of the important information we need to know about each one of these. Let's start with vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is acquired from the sun, which would be in the form of D3 or cholecalciferol, or from the diet, which is D2 or ergocalciferol. Now in order for vitamin D to be biologically active, we need to convert it to the hormonally active form. That is known as 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. Now the way this occurs is through two steps. 
Step one is in the liver, where that cholecalciferol gets hydroxylated to 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. That happens via the enzyme 25 hydroxylase. Now, step two, that occurs in the kidney, where that 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol will serve as the substrate for one alpha hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that gives us one 25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. That is our biologically active form of vitamin D that's also known as calcitrol. They make it so confusing by naming things multiple times, but it is what it is. Now, the major inducer of that one alpha hydroxylase enzyme that I mentioned, um, which is the major control point of producing the active form of the hormone, is parathyroid hormone, as well as low levels of phosphate. So if PTH is elevated, phosphate is low, as well as if calcium is low, we will see an increased production of that 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. So when PTH increases, we will get an increased renal calcium reabsorption as well as a decrease in renal phosphate reabsorption. Now, excessive levels of vitamin D can be seen with too much supplementation or they may be seen in certain diseases like granulomatous disease. Now, common symptoms of a vitamin D excess or vitamin C toxic, vitamin D excess or toxicity would be hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, a loss of appetite, as well as stupor. A deficiency of vitamin D is, of course, associated with rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. Now, this could be the result of malabsorption, a lack of exposure to adequate sunlight, or a diet that lacks sufficient, level, sufficient levels of vitamin D. Uh, we could also see it in chronic kidney disease or advanced cases of liver disease. Now, signs and symptoms that will tip you off to this are boing of the legs in children. As well, in adults, you'll typically see things like bone pain and muscle weakness. Now, hypocalcemic tetany would be another symptom that you want to be on the lookout for here due to the close relationship of calcium and vitamin D homeostasis. Next up, we have vitamin E. Vitamin E serves as an antioxidant, mainly serving the cell membranes and the red blood cells. Now, as such, if we are deficient in this vitamin, we will see consequences that are linked to its function, like hemolytic anemia, muscle weakness, posterior column demyelination. All of those might be seen with a vitamin E deficiency. That's why a vitamin E deficiency can actually look like a vitamin B12 deficiency as far as those neuroscience and symptoms go. But the way that you're gonna differentiate be between the two is very simple and it's with lab findings, where a vitamin E deficiency will not demonstrate megaloblastic anemia, will not show neutrophil hypersegmentation, or won't show an increase in serum methylmalonic acid levels. Vitamin B12 deficiency obviously will. Now, as we stated in the matching exercise here, an excess in children can cause enterocolitis. Next up, we have vitamin K, and this is, of course, important for coagulation, as its activated form is a cofactor for, of course, gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid residues on certain clotting factors. What are those clotting factors in proteins? Of course, clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10, as well as protein CNS. Remember the single most important farm detail regarding vitamin K has to do with warfarin, which will inhibit the vitamin K dependent synthesis of the proteins CNS and the factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And it does that by blocking the vitamin K epoxide reductase complex that is found in the liver. That depletes the reduced form of vitamin K, meaning it cannot act and go on and do its job as a cofactor in gamma carboxylation of those clotting factors. Okay. Now, vitamin K is also extremely important to neonates, um, and you need to know this. This is very commonly tested. This might be more so of a, vit of a uh, step two or three question, but you still need to know this. Now, vitamin K is really important in neonates because A, it's not found in breast milk, and B, their guts have not been exposed to the bacteria required to synthesize vitamin K. So we're going to give them an injection of vitamin K at birth. That will prevent any sort of hemorrhagic disease from happening. Now, let's say you screwed up and you didn't give them the shot. What you're going to see is hemorrhaging with an increase in PT and an increase in PTT, but you'd see normal bleeding time. Now, one last detail about vitamin K that you need to keep in mind is that if someone is using broad spectrum antibiotics, let's say for an extended period of time for whatever reason, that could actually lessen the amount of bacteria in the stomach that we need to synthesize vitamin K. Kind of like a newborn doesn't have the correct amounts of bacteria or any, um, same scenario would sort of come into play here because those antibiotics would kill them off. 
if this is the case, then we might also see hemorrhage as a result. So that's something important to keep in mind with antibiotics and vitamin K. Now, the final fat-soluble vitamin that we have here is vitamin A, which similarly to vitamin E acts as an antioxidant. Now, this is also necessary for visual health, as well as for the differentiation of normal cells into specialized tissues. Now, one of the uh, really important um, treatment or clinical uses of vitamin A it would be to treat measles, and it can also be used in cases of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Now, there's a drug known as Accutane. This is a derivative of vitamin A. Uh, specifically, it is isotretinoin. Um, and what's super important to remember with this drug, especially when we are starting a female on it, is because it is so teratogenic, we want to make sure they're not pregnant. And we also make sure they're using two forms of birth control. For example, uh, oral contraceptives or the shot, as well as perhaps condoms. Now, the reason why, like I said, this is highly teratogenic and it can lead to um, significant heart abnormalities, uh, facial abnormalities like cleft palate, um, but that's super important. I've seen this question pop up again and again. Now, a vitamin A toxicity acutely can cause things like blurring of the vision, vertigo. Um, chronic toxicities can lead to things like um, alopecia, hair loss, uh, dry and scaly skin. It can cause arthralgias. It can cause uh, hepatotoxicity, uh, hepatic enlargement, um, and a super high yield and always tested uh, condition that vitamin A uh, excess or toxicity can cause is idiopathic intracranial, intracranial hypertension. Um, remember, that is typically seen in a female um, associated with papilledema, headaches, uh, etc. And finally, a vitamin A deficiency can cause things like night blindness, dry scaly skin, uh, as well as the formation of bateau spots. Uh, those are the result of, uh, of uh, corneal squamous metaplasia. We might see corneal degeneration as well as immunosuppression. All right? Make sure you know your fat-soluble vitamins, super high-yield stuff, most likely to pop up on exam day. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, so go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is A. Let's talk about vitamin B1, which is also, of course, known as thiamine. So thiamine is needed as part of TPP, and this is a cofactor in a handful of dehydrogenase enzyme reactions, like uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, the branch chain uh, ketoacid dehydrogenase enzyme, the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase enzyme, uh, which is, of course, in the TCA cycle, as well as transketolase, which is found in the HMP shunt. Now, if we become deficient in B1, which is known, which is a, a known consequence of what? Malnutrition or chronic alcoholism, it can cause some pretty devastating consequences like Korsakoff syndrome, which is of course characterized by memory loss, which is permanent, uh, changes in personality, and of course those classic confabulations. Now, one of the problems experienced in a B1 deficiency is an inability to break down glucose. Now, this is going to be damaging to the tissues that are highly aerobic. So tissues like the brain and the heart would be susceptible to that. Now, when a patient is vitamin B1 deficient due to either malnutrition or, as I mentioned, chronic alcohol use, it is imperative that when we treat them, we administer thiamine before dextrose. Otherwise, we can actually precipitate Wernicke's encephalopathy, which, although reversible, is still a deadly neurologic condition, and that's characterized by confusion, ataxia, nystagmus, and ophthalmoplegia. There's also a condition known as Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. So take the findings of Wernicke encephalopathy, Korsakoff syndrome, combine them. That's kind of what we're dealing with here. And this would occur as a result of damage to both the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus and the mammillary bodies. Now, two additional problems that we might see with vitamin B1 deficiency are beriberi, dry and wet beriberi specifically. Now, remember that dry beriberi is characterized by symmetric muscle wasting as well as polyneuropathy, while wet beriberi is characterized by the presence of dilated cardiomyopathy and edema. Um, now, if a vitamin B1 deficiency is suspected, the way we can diagnose this is by observing an increased RBC transketolase activity shortly, shortly after the administration of B1, because remember, that is a cofactor for the transketolase enzyme. All right, uh, very important uh, that you keep the uh, vitamin B1 deficiency findings in mind, it's highly tested. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, so that means go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer.
All right, the correct answer here is C, which is coenzyme A. So in order to answer this, you need to know that B5 is associated with burning feet syndrome, and from there, that B5 is a component of coenzyme A. So although this was simple, you had to dig a little deeper. Pyridoxal phosphate, that is going to refer to vitamin B6. B6. Um, NAD plus and NADP plus refer to vitamin B3. Carboxylation reactions, this refers to vitamin B7. And thymine pyrophosphate, of course, that refers to the one we just talked about, vitamin B1. So let's take a look at the rest of the vitamins that we haven't covered yet, except we will save B9 and 12 for our next questions. So vitamin B2, this is also known as riboflavin. This is a component of both FMN and FAD. Those are, of course, needed as cofactors in redox reactions. Now, the big thing you want to remember about vitamin B2 is that a deficiency is associated with chelosis, uh, with a magenta tongue, which is when a tongue has this purplish red discoloration, as well as corneal vascularization. Vitamin B3 is also, of course, known as niacin, or might be referred to as nicotinic acid. This is a constituent of NAD plus and NADP plus. Those are, of course, used in redox reactions, as well as cofactors for dehydrogenases. Now, don't forget that this is derived from tryptophan, and that its synthesis also requires vitamins B2 and vitamin B6. Now, don't forget that niacin is often uh, tested with respect to its capacity to treat uh, dyslipidemia. And in fact, it's extremely effective in increasing HDL. But there's an unwanted side effect known as flushing, makes it highly undesirable and something that a lot of people simply won't tolerate. Um, and so that's oftentimes why we don't use it primarily. Now, just as a side note, if you're asked about this flushing, remember, it's caused by prostaglandins. Therefore, what drug could we give to block the synthesis of prostaglandins? Aspirin. So we can give aspirin along with niacin, and it can actually prevent that flushing reaction from taking place. Now, it's really important that you can recognize a vitamin B3 deficiency in a vignette because it's associated with a condition known as pellagra. Pellagra, you can identify with the three Ds. We used to call it the four Ds, but now we call it the three Ds, which are dermatitis, which is often referred to as a casal necklace uh, type of lesion, and this affects the C3 and C4 dermatomal area. The other Ds are diarrhea and dementia, and the fourth used to be death. We've also got to remember heart disease, which is an autosomal recessive condition that leads to neutral amino acid transporter deficiency in the proximal renal tubular cells and on enterocytes. And the reason why you want to remember this is because it presents with, with symptoms that are very similar to those seen in pellagra. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if we have too much B3, this could actually exacerbate gout. Now, vitamin B5 is also known as pantothenic acid, and this is a component of coenzyme A and fatty acid synthase. Now, there's a few important findings associated with a B5 deficiency. We have alopecia, we have dermatitis, enteritis, uh, distal paresthesias, dysesthesia, and burning feet syndrome, which of course was the, um, the initial question asked in this, uh, in this question. Now, Vitamin B6 is also, of course, known as pyridoxine, and this is converted to pyridoxal phosphate. That is a cofactor used in decarboxylation reactions, uh, transaminations, and in glycogen phosphorylase. Now, it's also needed for the synthesis of a variety of different products, like niacin, heme, glutathione, cystathione, histamine, as well as a few uh, neurotransmitters, like serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and dopa. Now, don't forget that isoniazid use is a commonly asked question, I call it super high yield, uh, with respect to the, its ability to induce a B6 deficiency. And a B6 deficiency is associated with peripheral neuropathy, convulsions, and hyperirritability. Um, a, B, a B6 deficiency can also cause a sideroblastic anemia. Now, the typical way this presents is you have a vignette, patient has a specific disease that warrants use of isoniazid, they develop the neural symptoms, you want to say, hey, what's going on? Or what do we supplement with? Which would be, of course, replacing the lost vitamin. Now, the, fight, the final vitamin that I want to just mention here is B7. This is also known as biotin. This plays a role as a cofactor in certain carboxylation reactions that add a one carbon group to a substrate. Now, a commonly asked question about biotin is biotin deficiency, which is linked to the ingestion of raw egg whites. There's a protein in raw egg whites called avidin. Avidin binds to biotin, and then it gets removed from the body. Therefore, raw egg whites 
um, can lead to a vitamin B7 deficiency or biotin deficiency. Okay, very uh, high yield question there with the avidin. Um, a lot of students miss that one, so keep that one in mind. All right, let's do some true or false questions. And these true or false questions are going to test your ability to understand vitamins B9 and 12. So as always with multiple with uh, true false questions, I'm going to stick with you here and I'll let you read the question and then we will discuss the correct answers. So let's dive in with our first question. True or false? Go. What do you guys think? This is false. B9 is absorbed in the jejunum. Next question. True or false? Go. What do you guys think? This is true. Now remember that the function of vitamin B9 is to convert to THF, which is a coenzyme for one carbon transfer or methylation reactions and is important for the synthesis of nitrogenous bases for the use in RNA and DNA. Next question, true or false? This is true. A B9 deficiency, while it will, it will cause macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, characterized by hypersegmented polymorphonuclear cells as well as glossitis, it will not, like B12, present with neurosymptoms. That's a major way by which you can differentiate between a B9 and a B12 deficiency. I'm sure you know that, but if you don't, now you do. Don't forget it. It's going to be tested. All right, let's move on to the next one. True or false? This is false. So women planning on conceiving should begin folate supplementation at least one month prior to conception and then taking it throughout the pregnancy. Uh, I believe many years ago it was 12 weeks. Now it's one month. Next question, true or false, go. This is true. So B12 is found in animal products, but not in plant products, and it is synthesized only by microorganisms. Now remember that a deficiency can be precipitated by malabsorption syndromes, as well as by parasitic infections. One of the commonly tested parasitic infections is of course with the, di the uh, Diphilobothrium latum infection. Now other possible causes that you absolutely need to keep in mind and be on the lookout for should include a lack of intrinsic factor, uh, that, could, that would occur as a result of things like pernicious anemia or having had gastric bypass surgery. Um, if there's an absence of a terminal, terminal ileum, right, that will cause a deficiency of B12 absorption. The use of certain drugs, um, with metformin being a well-known culprit. Um, and finally, I talked about this, I believe, either earlier in this lecture or in the last lecture, uh, a vegan diet, plant-based diet, can cause a B12 deficiency if Proper supplementation is not put into place, which is why it's important that you recommend supplementation to your patients on that type of diet. Next question, true or false, go. This is false. This is a cofactor for methionine synthase, not methionine reductase. And it's also a cofactor for methylmalonyl CoA mutase. Next question, true or false, go. This is false. A B12 deficiency will show elevated levels of both homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. Next question, true or false, go. This is true. Paresthesias and subacute combined degeneration are possible consequences of a vitamin B12 deficiency. Now remember that a myelin abnormality results in subacute combined degeneration. That refers to the dorsal columns the lateral corticospinal tracts, and the spinal cerebellar tracts. All right, next question, true or false, go. This is false. It masks everything except for those neural findings. Next question, true or false, go. This is true. Now, before we move on and do our final question of this lecture, Let's go over zinc and vitamin C because uh, we haven't touched on those yet, but they are important. So first, let's talk vitamin C. This is, of course, a highly potent antioxidant with a couple of important major functions. It is, of course, needed for collagen synthesis. Um, it is in, in, in collagen synthesis, it's needed for the hydroxylation of both proline and lysine. Um, it aids in iron absorption, and it does that by reducing iron to the Fe2 plus form. It's needed for the conversion of uh, DA into NE, dopamine into norepinephrine, specifically 
because it's needed by the enzyme that's responsible for that process, which is, of course, dopamine beta hydroxylase. Um, a deficiency of vitamin C, which you're not going to see in reality, but uh, on, in a vignette you might, um, it causes, of course, scurvy. And, and that's due to its role in the process of collagen synthesis. Remember, um, the, the uh, hydroxylation of both proline and lysine. Now remember, uh, scurvy would be associated with symptoms like uh, swollen gums, petechia, easy bruisability, hemarthroses, anemia, as well as poor wound healing. Um, and a couple of important findings associated with too much vitamin C could be the development of calcium oxalate stones. Uh, it could also cause iron toxicity, uh, but that's only going to be in someone who is genetically susceptible to that. The final nutrient here is zinc. Zinc is an important mineral, mineral in many enzymes, and if deficient, it can, uh, it can disrupt wound healing. It can also cause male hypogodonism. It can suppress the immune system. It can decrease the, decrease the growth of um, axillary hair, facial hair, as well as pubic hair. But its most unique feature is probably its ability to lead to a loss of smell and taste sensation. So anosmia and dyskusia. Now, defect in the intestinal ability to absorb zinc is associated with a specific condition known as acrodermatitis enteropathica. Probably not a ton of questions on that, but nonetheless, it's good to know. All right, let's do the last multiple choice question here of this lecture, and then we'll take a break. So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. correct answer here is B. Let's talk about marasmus and quashiorcor. Now remember that while quashiorcor is a condition associated with protein malnutrition, marasmus is a condition associated by malnutrition where the diet is deficient in calories, but there's no massive nutrient deficiencies. So there's no fully, fully uh, deficient vitamins or minerals in the body. So it's important you keep those two in mind. But the underlying problem seen in quashiorcor is the onset of edema as a result of a drop in plasma oncotic pressure due to low serum albumin, as well as liver malfunction characterized by fatty changes due to a decrease in apolipoprotein synthesis as well as deposition. Now the classic sign that you will see is an undersized child who has a swollen belly. That's a result of the um, plasma oncotic changes that I just mentioned. Now there's a handy mnemonic you can keep in mind that can help you remember the big picture findings of quashiorcor. That is MEALS, and MEALS just stands for malnutrition, edema, uh, anemia, liver, which is fatty, and skin lesions. Okay, make sure you know that. Um, make sure you know the underlying pathophysiology. It should be all set. All right, let's take a break. I'll see you guys on the next lecture. Uh -huh.